It's my great pleasure now to uh, introduce the next two speakers, uh, Grace Charles and, uh, do, you, do you want the formal name or the, the nickname? Cheng Cheng Zen, uh, Zeng. And uh, they're my medical students. Uh, they, they took my dermatology course uh, at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. And uh, I asked who wants to do a project on periodic paralysis, which is kind of weird to ask in a dermatology course, right? But um, they were tenacious and they volunteered. And uh, so uh, we did a, a survey trying to characterize hyperkalemic periodic paralysis because uh, now we, with the internet, we started to gather a whole bunch more people with genetic mutations. And so uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna go for it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Next. Um, so today, Chan Chang and I will speak to you about the characteristics of hyper-EP, as well as our study on the disorder and approaches to prevention and management. <laughs> the literature um, first mentioned hyper-EP about 60 years ago when Tyler and his colleagues described a family who had frequent short attacks of paralysis. And they noted that the triggers were rest after exercise, stress, and certain foods. He also described the disorder as autosomal dominant with complete penetrance. And just so we're all on the same page, autosomal dominant means that if one parent carries the mutation, uh, the it can pass on to the child and the child can have that disorder. And complete penetrance means that if you carry that mutation, you will express it. <clears throat> so that, in other words, if, um, if your father has hyper -PP and your brother has hyper -PP, but you don't, and then you have a baby, it's very unlikely your baby will have hyper -PP because if you had that mutation, you would have expressed it. Okay, so five years later, um, Dr. Gamstor comes along, and he describes a second family with similar characteristics as the first. Um, and he noted, very importantly, that during attacks, many of the family members had elevated levels, and that um, potassium administration provoked attacks. So it was really these two reports that um, distinguished hyper -PD from the more common hypo version. Next. Um, okay, so some basics. What is hyper -PD? Simply, it's um, a muscle disorder with episodes of weakness that are uh, typically induced by increased um, increases in potassium. And you, um, hyper PP can present with or without paramyotonia congenita, which, as we discussed, is that paradoxical increased stiffening with activity. Um, why does someone get it? It's typically hereditary, but it can be spontaneous. So even someone with no family history of the disorder may present um, with hyper PP. Next. Uh, it's due to the, this troublemaker. Um, uh, mutated skeletal muscle sodium channel. Who gets it? Basically, um, the disease typically onsets in infancy or early childhood. The prevalence is about one in every 200,000 people, and men and women seem uh, to be equally affected. Common triggers are cold exposure, rest and exercise, stress, fasting, ingesting potassium, or anesthesia. The disease is marked by um, attacks of weakness, which can be vocal, affecting one limb or um, multiple limbs, or generalized paralysis of the body. Um, so literature reports that attacks in hyper-PP typically spare consciousness, the cranial muscles, and respiration. In our study, we actually found um, some hyper-PP individuals reported otherwise, and we were wondering if there's actually any um, hyper-PP people in the audience who could comment on, on that during an attack. Yeah, I'm, I, well, I have a um, hyper and my son, who's 17, is also hyper. Uh, my family's hyper. Um, and my son, like, he has it much worse than I do. But when he gets it, He's, he's really laid out for multiple days, and for him to get up, it's almost like he really has to struggle, and it's almost like he can never catch his breath. He's always like, <gasps> and it's just trying to walk, and, you know, he's doing it. So, obviously, the respiratory does get, you know, um, a 
affected by it. And you know, as far as the arrhythmia, and then he'll say that his heart, and you can hear it when his heart is pounding, but it's probably just the strain and trying to get up and move because it can't. Yeah, I think, by the way, that, you know, we love to put these things in neat little boxes in the textbook so you can make a table that says hyper, you know, occurs in, you know, onset in, in infancy and the attacks are in a few minutes and, uh, you know, and it's just not so clear cut like that. And I, I think that, but it, that's why it's important that they're doing this. Uh, we'll, we'll get one more in here and then we'll go on. Hi, I'm Anson Tolo, but I suspect I'm um, I have a ptosis and also it affects my tongue, so definitely muscles of my head. Thank you. Um, and other typical signs and symptoms reported include uh, some people are affected with muscle pain. Some people also report cardiac arrhythmias, which can be due to the elevated potassium. And you see the classic uh, EKG of a hyper PK individual right over there. <laughs> between attacks, so muscle, they have a delayed um, relaxation after muscle contraction. The typical course of hyper-PP is that um, attacks increase in frequency and severity through adolescence and early adulthood. Then sometime around middle age, attacks tend to decrease in frequency, um, but around that time, this permanent muscle weakness begins to onset. Okay, so um, our survey, as Dr. Levitt mentioned, he, um, back in our dermatology course last year, he mentioned this, his idea that hyper-PP really um, needs to be studied more. There's so much we want to know about it. So uh, it was his idea that we do this survey um, finding more information out of that, the general information of who has uh, the disorder, the diagnosis and symptoms, uh, treatment and management approaches that could be effective for the disorder, and any um, special situations that are involved with hyper-PP. So, um, we're, right now, we have um, 72 responses, 43 are genetically identified, and we're really grateful to Dr. Lehman Horn, who took the survey that we created, translated it to German, and sent it out to um, many hyper-PP individuals he knows, and so we've had many uh, German responses and responses from all around the world um, to our online survey. Um, so as you see, about half of our uh, um, study participants had hyper-PD with uh, PMC and half had no PMC. The age range really varied. We had from age 9 to 84. And the um, men and women made up about 50-50 of the population. Interestingly, all participants reported a family history of hyper-PD. Um, so these are some of the other health problems that our participants reported. Seven people reported high triglycerides and cholesterol. And we have to wonder if, um, since due to the hyper-PP, they're limited in their ability to exercise and have eat high carbohydrates. Is, it, is this um, causing people to have this elevated cholesterol level. Uh, seven also reported thyroid problems, which we can't explain. Next. These represent the, all the mutations that are right now represented in our study. And as you see, those two mutations on the right make up the majority of the Of our survey. Um, so first about diagnosis and kind of the what's been called the diagnostic odyssey that a lot of you have been through. Um, <clears throat> age at first attack, um, kind of consistent with the literature, a lot of people do experience the first attack in their first decade of life. Um, but interestingly, some people do, do not experience the first attack until their teenage years. So that's something that's also important to note that it's not always um, the first decade of life. Um, and then the time to diagnosis is, I think, something that all of you have found very frustrating as well. Over 50% of our respondents noted that it took them over seven years to um, diagnose what they had. And in some people, it took decades, like over 30 years, or one person said 60-something years it took them to find out what they had. So it's really an issue that um, I think a lot of you have noticed as well. Um, 
the specialists that they found were most helpful were neurologists, um, which um, I think makes sense, but importantly, a lot of people, most people had to see several physicians before someone could diagnose them. Um, so again, that highlights um, the issue with kind of education of physicians and um, just getting awareness out there about the disease. Um, and as I'm sure not, um, many of you are not surprised about, a lot of people were misdiagnosed. 40% um, of people were diagnosed with psychiatric disorders and um, things of that sort. And you know, in medical school, they teach us that in psychiatry, you really have to rule out all organic causes of symptoms before you resort to psychiatric um, diagnoses. And these are all people that are genetically diagnosed. So it's really, it really seems inappropriate for people to kind of be diagnosed with something psychiatric before something was um, discovered organically. But again, this, this relates to the issue of awareness and education of the medical community, too, about you know, whether they know about this condition. Um, so some, so some characteristics of um, the episodes that people experience. Um, usually, people receive some warning signs in under an hour. Um, some people a little longer than that, and these attacks are typically um, a variety of stiffness and weakness. Um, and um, while a lot of people experience um, partial body attacks, there are a lot of people that experience full body attacks, and then in some it's more limited um, to a specific area of the body. Um, most people report mild or moderate episodes, meaning that they can still call for help or um, kind of reach for medicine or something of that sort, but um, some people do experience kind of full paralysis where they can't do anything. Um, the frequency of attacks um, ranges from a couple times a month to a couple times a day. Um, and then what's important to note is um, hyper -PP is often kind of described as more often brief attacks with, um, in comparison to hypo, but a significant number of our respondents noted that their attacks last for much longer than that, for example, over 20 hours or up to days, and so that's really something to recognize as well. It again doesn't fit into this box of being very brief attacks, um, and a lot of these are these episodes are surrounded um, or they surround kind of sleep. So in the morning, whether it's waking up from the night or after um, taking naps or during sleep, um, seems to be the most common. <clears throat> Um, and then this is something that Grace talked about earlier. Um, we noticed that you know there's a, the wide range of every almost every body part that can be affected by these episodes. Um, importantly, although the literature describes that it's not um, usually affecting breathing muscles or cranial muscles, our respondents noted that you know a lot of the time their speaking mus musculature, their breathing musculature, and their eyelids and things like that are all affected. So again, that's something that perhaps needs to be explored further because it does contrast with what the kind of the box of the literature says currently. And then in terms of associated symptoms, um, a lot of people feel numbness and tingling, um, but there, there are a lot of other um, muscle-related groups, for example, breathing muscles as well as muscles to control bladder and bowel function as well that can be affected. Um, and then this is also an interesting issue. A lot of people know that they have symptoms surrounding the episodes of weakness that are not weakness, um, but are other things that they experience. Um, for example, after attacks, a lot of people feel muscle pain, clumsiness, um, fatigue, irritability, and mental dullness. And this actually draws a parallel to um, a, another neurologic disorder, epilepsy, where people often after they have a seizure and they've recovered from the seizure, they still experience what they call post um symptoms, which means they have a lot of, like for example, fatigue and mental dullness. So um, this is something that could be interesting that could, ha could happen in hyper-PP as well. Um, and then in addition, um, mood around attack seems to be affected in a large proportion of, of people as well, um, with kind of, again, the fatigue and the irritability um, that a lot of people feel. <clears throat> So triggers for attacks, um, these largely confirm what um, people like Dr. Lehmann-Horn have um, written in the literature, um, and kind of the, a large number of triggers, the majority of, uh, the, or the most frequent of which are rest after exercise, cold, and changes in the activity level. Um, and the, as expected, the disease really
really does have a, a big effect on other parts of life. So one big thing um, is weight gain, which <clears throat> may relate to the increase in carb intake, um, as well as a decrease in activity level and limitations in exercise. And this can also re relate to the cardiovascular um, effects that Grace mentioned earlier as well. Um, progressive myopathy, meaning um, some type of permanent progressive um, muscle weakness, um, was also seen in, in a number of our respondents. Um, and then, as might be expected, it, it has impact, for a lot of people, it has impacted family life, relationships, work, and school, and physical and mental health. Um, and then one thing that Dr. Grace mentioned earlier as well is that a lot of our respondents felt that they, despite having a genetic diagnosis of hyper-PP, do experience episodes where they feel like they are low in their potassium and where their symptoms improve when they take potassium. So that's something that um, we thought was very interesting and may, may kind of, again, challenge the whole, the whole hyper-PP um, nomenclature and the, the idea that this is always related to high potassium levels. Uh, check, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it, it's important to note, though, that this is just a survey. So this is all, it is genetically diagnosed people, so that's awesome. But it is also self-report. It's very slippery to characterize this disease. Uh, I would love to, to have hard data of, yes, my potassium was 3.0, and I took 20 million equivalents of potassium, and now I feel better. And if we had six, you know, 16% of hard data to support this, we could make a really great conclusion. This is like shows that this is a great thing that we can now study concretely. So, like the survey lets us, you know, hone in on areas that really should be looked at. Yeah, so it would need to be confirmed by things like blood tests during these attacks. But very interesting finding. <coughs> Um, so we just wanted to touch on some points about um, medication management. Um, so uh, people use a, a wide variety of um, things to help treat their acute attacks and kind of on a daily basis. Um, important to note, um, in contrast to, you know, in hypokalemic periodic paralysis, a lot of people can take uh, potassium and often that can help, um, but um, in, in hyper, um, it seems that it's really not worked out what can work, and there's a variety of what can work, um, but in a, an important number of people, they can never really kind of abort the attacks that they're going through with any type of medication. So that's really important to point out. Um, and in terms of chronic medications, um, diamox and thiazide diuretics have been um, what people have used and what they feel like works, but um, most people feel that there's some level of improvement that needs to be achieved with their medication. So again, this highlights kind of the need for more efficacious treatments and kind of research to, to kind of work on um, more treatments and better treatments. Um, and kind of mirroring the time to diagnosis, um, a lot of people have required a, a large number of years to achieve what they're currently on. And even despite that, they still feel like they need improvement in their regimen. So again, this highlights kind of the need for um, better treatments. Um, so in terms of dietary management, um, you know, a number of people report uh, taking carbohydrate-rich snacks, but this hasn't really been um, something that's been as consistent. Um, the, the main thing that we wanted to take away from this was that um, a lot of people um, use sweets during an attack to try to avoid the attack, and um, of those people that noticed a difference between liquid and solid sweets, um, more people notice that liquid sweets um, do work faster than solid sweets, for example, Coca-Cola versus candy or something like that. Has, has anyone noticed any difference in that or what they use? Coke is better? Yeah, so that's something that we, we saw in our, in our study as well. Um, and then just kind of touching on what specific foods have been helpful to people, the most common ones noted were candy, um, straight sugar, um, or carbohydrate-rich um, things like pasta or bread. Um, and then in terms of other things that people do, um, again, kind of keeping warm, sugary food and gentle exercise are things that people have used. The exercise, um, most people uh, have commented that it consists of walking, um, so kind of the gentle exercise. And then as with any periodic paralysis, um, keeping items within reach so that they can kind of um, be available in case of an episode is, has been an important thing. 
people do. Um, and then just touching on some special, special situations um, with regard to pregnancy and anesthesia. Um, well, pregnancy is in the literature noted to be a trigger for attacks. Um, in our study, people actually found a variety of responses. Some people felt it was got better with less frequent attacks, some people thought it got worse. So it seemed actually to vary um, among our respondents. Um, and then with regard to local and general anesthesia, um, for most people that underwent these, they did not find a problem. But importantly, um, in the people where it did trigger an attack, a lot of people commented that it's kind of one of the worst attacks of their life. And so it, it can be definitely a problem. And that's something that you know we definitely have to um, keep in mind when people go for procedures. It's an important thing to notify your anesthesiologist about. Okay, so when you look at this slide, if you use your imagination, you can kind of see a K on the end of the key. And that's because the key to prevention is potassium. <laughs> um, so specifically avoiding potassium. Uh, you want to avoid foods rich in potassium, of course, and any medications that can elevate your potassium. Along those same lines, it's important to avoid fasting, as fasting can cause um, the potassium to go up a little. So specifically, something someone might want to try is to eat a little more frequently snacks throughout the day, um, carbohydrate-rich snacks throughout the day. Um, also, there's some reports in the literature that uh, a high salt diet reduces attack frequency and severity. Has anyone here um, had that experience or can deny that experience? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Salt helps. Salt helps. Okay. Um, as with many things in hyper-PP, um, it's a little unclear how to advise exactly concerning exercise. Um, one thing that has been found is that if you do strenuous exercise, and um, rather than just stopping, if you continue some, uh, some gentle exercises afterwards, that can um, prevent an attack. Also, it's important to avoid uh, exposure to cold. And some useful medications that can be taken daily include the thiazide, diuretics, acetazolamide, and albuterol. Of course, with these medications, your uh, physician should be monitoring your electrolyte levels. Uh, considering uh, the, um, as with exercise, it's a little unclear how to advise um, aborting an acute attack. Some logical steps you might want to consider include some sugar intake or mild exercise for a mild attack. And for a moderate or severe attack, you can consider taking some medications such as um, the thiazide diuretics um, and inhaled beta agonists such as salbutamol. Um, the, there's some controversy in the literature over glucocorticoids, and in our study as well, we had some people. Uh, well, one person found glucocorticoids helpful, but multiple people said they made attacks worse. Has anyone here had experience with that? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, so, so Birch, I apologize to put you on the spot here in the back. Um, you know, with, with hypo, right, you said that if you have an attack, it should be aggressively treated. And so with, with hyper, the question is, you know, with, hy with hypo, you give potassium, it's a prescription, you know, medication. With, with hyper, is aggressively treating just with sipping some coke enough, or do they have to like go and take an albuterol inhaler or pop a diuretic when the acute attack is going on? So I think I may have been misinterpreted in terms of my thought about being fairly aggressive about attack prevention. I talk about attack prevention and getting people on a regimen that prevents their attacks. In hypo, the attacks are often so severe that you need to treat them with oral potassium, and unquestionably the attacks improve reasonably quickly with large dose oral potassium. The key, though, is not to have to prevent the attacks, but to, to, to treat the attacks, but to prevent them. So most patients with hyper say, well, look, I can manage my attacks. I take an inhaler, or I take some carb, and that, and that gets rid of them. But it doesn't. And I'm worried that patients are having attacks that are not severe enough, they require treatment, they're not worried about them, and I think they're damaging.
tension and muscle vibration pattern the attacks. So I think that it's important to give people on a preventive regimen for any form of periodic paralysis. Gotcha. So any one, any one attack, whether you treat it or not, aggressively, not so important. The, the message is mainly that not to dismiss a lot of minor attacks as no attacks and get on something properly preventative. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, um, lastly, IV calcium would be something uh, they might use in the hospital to protect your heart in an attack. So, um, from reading the survey responses and learning about periodic paralysis, these were some thoughts we had about uh, maybe helpful um, uh, things to try. One is, you know, if you work out if your attacks are induced by uh, rest after exercise and maybe working out in the gym and then getting in your car to drive home is, is not the best um, idea. So we thought to, uh, it might be a good idea to have a treadmill at home or some gym equipment at home so that way you're in a safe place in case of an attack. Another idea is um, some people find it difficult to work out at a really slow pace, maybe trying some uh, Music that uh, is set to a slow beat might make that a little more, um, a little easier. Also, people report that stress can induce an attack. So it'd be interesting to try if you're having a stressful day um, or a stressful time in your life to set aside some time to do a calming activity, maybe a guided meditation CD or something along that line. Uh, finally, we were really interested in what um, people did for post-attack muscle soreness. Uh, hyper PPs tend to be really tough people, and most most of they just grin and bear it. But um, some suggestions include <coughs> applying Tiger Balm or um, taking Advil. Uh, so now I wanted to tell you about some special situations involving hyper PP. One major one is surgery. I don't want to scare anybody, um, but it's 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 um, something that you should be aware of and that um, you want to make sure the anesthesia staff is aware of if you go in for surgery. Basically, the opioids and depolarizing agents that they use in the anesthesia can cause myotonia, which makes it difficult for them to intubate and ventilate um, with, if, if, if myotonia results. So, um, and then also, when you're recovering from the procedure, you could have breathing difficulty or generalized paralysis. So some things that it's important um, that the anesthesia staff is aware of uh, include that they should prevent carbohydrate depletion. So unlike in a hypo PP patient, um, in a hyper PP patient, the um, anesthesia staff needs to give you D5W, the, the um, sugar, uh, to, um, and avoid muscle relaxants whenever possible. Also to maintain a normal body temperature, and of course to monitor potassium levels so um, they don't become too elevated. Finally, if a family member is going for a procedure where they know they're going to need anesthesia, and even if they're asymptomatic, it would be a good idea for them to be tested for your family's mutation, um, just so any preventive measures can be taken. Uh, so we've also found, and probably many of you know that, a change in your routine um, in particular can result in attacks. So even though um, I know when we go on vacation or if you go to Orlando and you're trying to enjoy the PPA conference, maybe you want to sleep in and change your schedule, but it's really um, to your benefit to try to keep your normal routine, wake up at your normal time, um, and follow your normal meal regimen. And a um, periodic paralysis pearl is of your girl is safe in pregnancy. And at the end of our survey, we asked um, the hyper peers if they had any tips for their um, for their fellow hyper peers. And these were some of the overarching principles. Uh, one is to know what works for you. Just because something works for your parents or for someone else you meet, that regimen might not be your optimal regimen. Also, get all the sort of support possible and don't be afraid to talk about it. Considering that many people just you know, the disease prevalence is about 1 in 200,000, so there's about 199,000 some people out there who never heard of it, and they just really don't know what you go through. So stand up for your rights and learn all you can um, to your benefit to educate yourself and others so um, you can inform them of your condition and what you need. And um, hyper-PPRs are very ad adamant that 
the diagnosis is a long road, it's really worth it to get diagnosed. Um, finally, our survey is still open to no till November 18th, so if you um, would like to participate or have anything to share, please be in touch. That's our email address, hyperbbsurvey at gmail.com. And thank you very much. Wait, so um, yeah, just one, one thing, one comment about research in general, uh, and thank you guys for like a wonderful presentation. Uh, is the, the enthusiasm of the researchers is fueled by the enthusiasm of the participants. So, you know, if we throw a survey out there and people don't bite at it, then maybe we won't throw another survey out there because people, maybe we interpret that as people don't care, or they're complacent, or they're satisfied with what's there now. So uh, it's in all the patients' interest, collectively around the world, uh, to really try to participate and show interest in, in, um, in these kind of things, be it surveys or uh, other research, because that fuels the energy of the investigators and it also demonstrates really it, you know, what the real true unmet need is. If a lot of people participate, there's probably a real true unmet need. If a lot of people say, ah, the heck with it, then maybe there isn't such a need. Hmm? Um, up until now, only people who are genetically diagnosed are allowed to participate in the survey. Yes. So, so right now, uh, right now we're limiting it to genetic diagnoses, uh, and I'm not sure strategically how we can expand that, um, because if you don't have a genetic diagnosis, then we don't know what we're dealing with officially. Even though you can characterize hyper by a clinical, a certain set of clinical diagnoses that, well, you rest, uh, I mean, you exercise, you rest, your potassium is high, and you get weak, you know, therefore you have hyper regardless of what gene it is. Uh, you know, we can definitely think about doing surveys for that kind of population, but it's it's much more difficult in terms of in terms of screening and and other things like that. Uh, so we're just limiting it right now to hypers, but we are working on that problem in terms of figuring out how to go. I read, I believe it was on your website, <clears throat> that hypers when they have attacks, they should take a couple of sips of potassium to break the attack, but make sure you don't overdo it. Was that on? Is it with with hypers or hyper? hyper? Yeah, because there's a shift going on in the potassium and it actually goes low, and so you need it. Uh, and I don't know what I am. I think I'm hyper, what, but I don't know. You, you should show me where on the website because maybe that's not the best advice. I mean, it, it, okay, it maybe for some people, but that's probably not as a blanket statement. That doesn't sound familiar to anybody, though? I don't, does it sound familiar to anybody, Bert? Right. No. Well, anyways, I don't know what I am. But I know before I knew I would, my attacks would last for three days. And now when I have these attacks, I sit uh, potassium just three or four sips, and it'll break it. And within 20 minutes, I can go back to functioning again. But again, I don't know what I have. OK, no, fair enough. But it's look, you know, this is one of those things where it's important to share your individual experiences. And you know, people kind of can discuss this with their doctors. and tested and controlled you know, circumstances, and so that's why it's important that we're all sharing these.